everybody a very happy Friday to you. Welcome back to Friday's Live, part of Find My Past From Home. It's our free family history series designed just for you. It's for everybody who's interested in history, house history, family history, um, wh whatever floats your boat, really. My name is Ellie. I'm Senior Community Executive at Find My Past. I am one of four hosts that presents Friday's Live. And it's a place where we can all come together at the end of the week and discuss what we found this week. Uh, we're going to be looking at some new records that Farmer Past has added today. We are going to also have a little look back at this season of Who Do You Think You Are with some delving into the records on Farmer Past as well regarding each of the celebrities. In fact, I'm not going to do all of them. I'm going to do some of them. And then if we've got a little bit of time, we will also do a little bit of brick wall busting as well, if we have time. Um, but you guys are going to have to keep me on track, OK? So if we're not finished with the Who Do You Think You Are by sort of 22, quarter two, you guys need to stop me and we will move on to a brick wall if you so wish. Please introduce yourself. Say where you are joining from today in the comments. Tell me how your week's been, what you've been working on in terms of your family tree. If you're new, we absolutely don't bite. This is a very relaxed, friendly we tell some terrible jokes, a little bit of banter. It's that sort of atmosphere. So uh, you are more than welcome if you're new. Please introduce yourself. Uh, you'll find like-minded people in our lovely community in the comments. Um, so, yeah, before I kick off, uh, let's welcome got lots of you here. Just lovely, lots of familiar names. Uh, hello, Roz. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Joe. Uh, we've got Gina, Jenny, Karen, Matthew, Kim, Jane, Ellen, Rosie, Jean, Lynn, Jenny, Sarah, Georgia. Oh, and that's just those of you who have said hello in the comments so far. I can see lots of you watching from both. So we're streaming on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter live today. Um, so, yeah, we've got Heather joining us from Edinburgh. It is warm today, isn't it? I actually went outside over my lunch break and sat outside in the garden for a little bit. And I've not done that in about two weeks because the weather in Edinburgh has been awful you would not think it was July um but I'm not complaining given that there are some people uh suffering from wildfires elsewhere in the world so I'm not complaining and I hope everybody is is very safe uh yeah lots of people joining this we've got Robin from New Jersey hello uh Rita from Cherry Hill New Jersey as well Oh, this is fantastic. So many of you here today. Uh, Wendy joining us. It's been over a year since you've been able to do so in Dallas. Hello, Wendy. It's your Friday's live anniversary. then. We're going to call it your Friday's live anniversary. I'm going to make that a thing. Uh, Janet saying it's overcast in North Wales. Um, I should hopefully be heading back that way for work, actually. Um, can't tell you about it yet. I'll tell you about it soon. Um, heading back that way next weekend i think um uh anita joining us from lincolnshire sort of sunny yes I, i'll take the sort of sunny um probably over the rain okay lovely um and deb joining us from florida god goodness we are uh we're very international today i'm, I'm enjoying it very much indeed Okay, so before we start, because we have got a packed agenda today, um, I did want to let you know, and I don't have a link available, I really should have got the link. Um, if you are able to get to um, Cheshire on the 16th of September, we are doing our Heritage Open Days event. Last year we did it at the Savoy, this year we are, are at Quarry Bank Mill in Cheshire. Very, very exciting. So... The Saturday the 16th is the ticketed event and um, you have to, like with the Savoy last year, you have to put your name in a ballot and then we will randomly draw um, the tickets. And I think it's, you can enter for yourself and then you get a ticket for you and somebody else as well. So you can bring a friend or a family member, for example, preferably somebody who's interested in family history, but it's, it's not required. Um, so, yeah, there's that you can do. All the information is on the Heritage Open Days website. If you go onto that and then you search Quarry Bank Mill, you'll be able to find it. Really should have prepared a link. That's my bad. Um, so there's the ticketed event on that day. And then also on the Sunday, the 17th of September, also at Quarry Bank Mill, there is going to be a more of an open day. And it's just anybody who wants to come along can come along. And I'm actually going to be giving a talk on that day, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be there. Jen's going to be there. I think Niall is. 
um, Liam as well. There's going to be loads of us there. So come along and we're just going to bask in the incredible scenery of Quarry Bank Mill. And, you know, it's a place filled with history. And we're going to do things like reveals and discoveries and family history help and talks. And uh, it's going to be really good fun. So if you are able to come to Cheshire to Quarry Bank Mill on either of those two days, head over to the Heritage, Heritage Open Days website and uh, take a look. That is all of my housekeeping. Okay, shall we do some new records? Because uh, again, we've got a lot to get through this week. Um, we have added quite a bit. Okay, and um, I want to apologise in advance for my pronunciation of pretty much anything. What have we added? Uh, so we've got Fermanagh Parish Records, we've got Scotland Paula Records, Canadian Headstone Index Records, and then uh, over 112,000 new newspaper pages to explore. So let's take a look at the Fermanagh Parish Records first. So we have updated the record sets for baptisms, marriages and burials. And then we've got a new set for congregational records. And in total, these are just over 15,000 records. And these are for the parish. These are for, excuse me, St. Mary's in Mahara Kulmoni. I think that's how you pronounce it um, in Northern Ireland. And these are Church of Ireland records there. So they're not Catholic. Now, I always like to try and test these out for you guys so you can see. Oh, question of the week. Thank you for reminding me, Matthew. Yes, that is a question of the week. Thank you very much. Uh, bear with me a second. A uh, question of the week is, which of your discoveries do you think would make an epic Who Do You Think You Are episode? That is the question of the week I want to hear. If you were the star of a Who Do You Think You Are episode, I want to know which of your discoveries would be the headline one. Like, what is gonna, every, gonna, everybody going to be interested in? That is what I want to know this week. Okay, which of your discoveries do you think would make an epic Who Do You Think You Are episode? And we will come back to that in a bit. Thank you, Matthew. Yes, you keep, keep, keep me on the straight and narrow. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rosie, for sharing the Quarry Bank Mill ballot. You guys, I don't know what I'd do without you. So thank you very much. It's much appreciated in a week that has been, it's been a week. Anyway, OK, back to the records. OK, so, yes, um, when I do these new records, I like to test them out for you. So I have some Northern Irish on my family tree on my father's side so my great-grandmother was she was born in what is now Northern Ireland um so I thought it would be fun to use some of the surnames from my family tree to test these out for you so I went with McKenna and this is the baptism for Mervyn McKenna baptized on the 4th of July 1887 his parents were John and Mary Ann McKenna and it tells me that John was a farm herder which we can see was added in the notes so that's a baptism. Uh, for the marriages, we've got Rose McKenna, who married William Keyes on the 10th of November, 1837. Sadly, there were no McKennas in the burial records. Um, but I did have a look for Walsh, because that's another uh, surname that appears for me on the Northern Irish side of my family tree. Um, there were none for the new records, but I chose a different uh, church instead. So I chose Margaret Walsh, and she was buried on the 19th of September, 1886, and she was 65. Then we've got the congregational records. So these ones are the new ones. And there were three McKennas in the congregational records. So I went for Charles McKenna, who was entered here on the 27th of March, 1826. And it also tells me that his name appeared in the poor list in the vestry books. So that's a really key bit of detail for me there. Um, he was also there in 1823 as well, as was an Anne McKenna in 1818. And these are all in the same parish. So what's quite interesting about the congregational records, unlike typical parish records, which, you know, your, your baptisms, your marriages, your burials, which just mention when people were baptised, married, buried, or even census records that are just once a decade, records like congregational records can help us pinpoint where our ancestors were in other times during their lives and gives us an insight into how they lived in a local parish. So we can see here with Charles McKenna that he was on the poor list, for example. I sort of think these are a little bit like a little bit like electoral registers in the sense that with the census being every 10 years, you can then fill in the gaps with electoral registers sometimes, you know, bearing in mind that, you know, women couldn't appear on electoral registers until quite late on. Um, so, yes, let's move on. Now, this is my favourite release of the week. 
these are the Scotland poor law and poor lists. There's two, 2,554, I think, new records. And these are all for Inverness. And these are perfect if you have working class ancestors from this Highland city. Now, these are, um, oh no, you've got to go, Daphne. Okay, we'll, we'll catch up another time. Bye, Daphne. Um, these are really, really good um, because although they are transcript only, they are very detailed, very detailed transcripts. Um, really, really cool. Um, tip, I think most of these are from minutes that were uh, that were taken in Inverness to do with poor law and relief hearings and things like that. And um, although my Scottish swan ancestors, yes, I have swan in my Scot Scottish family tree, were from Dumfriesshire, I thought I'd give that surname a whirl. And there are a couple of records here. And I actually had to put this particular record on two sides because it's that long and it's a transcript. So what can we actually glean from this? So we've got Catherine Fraser, who was born Catherine Swan. She was around 40 in 1891. This hearing took place on the 23rd of April 1891 and her birthplace was Inverness. Her husband was Finley Fraser, who was a tailor, um, and he died on the 7th of July 1891. And then you've got all of their children and their ages in one section. But then you've also got the children who are old enough to be living away from home or working out, out of home. Um, so you've got where those children are working and what they're working as super super detailed it tells me that Catherine is listed as wholly destitute and partially disabled on account of her young children so she's very very likely struggling to support all of her children we learn that she is protestant i'm just going to uh, we've got the a mountain description of her relief i'm going to move on here here we go this is what i mean loads and loads of detail here um and we've also got her residence of 57 King Street in Inverness. And then this mahusive, I know that's not a word, mahusive bit of detail here, breaks down the poor relief she received and when she received it, how much she received, even as far as when they received clothes and boots for the children. Now, you all know that it would not be a Friday's Live with me if I didn't go down the rabbit hole and see if I can find out even more about this family. Um, you, I think you'd be disappointed if I didn't. Let's be very honest. Um, so, yeah, I found their family in 1881. They were living at Tullock's Buildings in Inverness at the time. And Finley is indeed a tailor. We see those elder children and plus two of the younger children. And then 1891, around the time of that poor law record, we can see the family at 57 King Street. Um, and it, I don't I, because we don't have the original ones um, of the Scottish censuses on on farmer pastures. Go to Scotland's people for those. Um, it seems to me that Elsie, who was 11, was almost missed off, um, as in she was listed after her youngest sister, Mary. But I can't confirm that without going to check the original. And I didn't go to check the original, but that would be worth checking. Poor Elsie. Um, I did find an announcement for, uh, oh, no, I've gone forward. Um, I did find an announcement for Finley's funeral in 1891, and it mentions that he was buried in Lock End Burial Ground. Even if you don't have Inverness ancestors, go and check these out just for the stories that you can pick out. Pick one and then use that as a, a little practice exercise for yourself over the weekend and see just how far the rabbit, down the rabbit hole you can go. Um, yes, Matthew, absolutely. Rabbit holes are expected. Good. I'm pleased we are all on the same page here. Uh, Gordon says his are more like single. <laughs> I think we've all felt that every now and then. Um, I think sometimes you need somebody to pull you back out and go, OK, let's let's move on now. Um, but uh, it does. It does happen. Um, lovely. I can see lots of questions of the week um, answers coming in. So I look forward to delving into those after we do the new record. So thank you very much. Keep them coming. I want to hear I want to hear all your amazing stories today. What what what? story would be the focus of your who do you think you are episode what is going to get everybody tuning in and watching 
Okay, let's move on to the Canadian Headstone Index. Um, so this is a huge release. So there's 1.8 million records um, that have been added into this collection, and they cover well over 300 years. You'll normally find a name, the cemetery, plus the inscription on the headstone. And I love this about headstone records, grave records, memorial inscription records, because that one inscription can normally unlock so many doors for you. Now, as my auntie is First Nations Canadian, I thought it would be really fun to search with her maiden name, Gerard. Um, and yeah, as we can see here, we get so much more of the family tree than just the single name. So, for example, we've got this record here for Jacqueline L. Dominic Gerard. Um, she is mentioned on her husband's gravestone. So it tells me if you look at the inscription, she was born in 1931. Um, but was presumably still alive when this was transcribed because we only get her birth date, not her death date. We learn that her husband um, is Bernard F. here, 1931 to 2008. Her father was Walter Dominic, 1901 to 1991. And then there's also an Alice Isson, uh, 1901 to 1992, but it doesn't actually give the relation. Excuse me, 1907 to 1992. And then we get the name of the cemetery as well. And then we have this other one. This is for Doris I. Gerard in Dundas. And um, the inscription gives her dates as 1903 to 2000. We get her mother, Florence Flower, um, 1880 to 1952. Her husband, Joseph Gerard, and then his father, George Gerard, as well. That is the beginnings of a whole family tree. You could literally, as I say, use these as practice, take that, start to make a family tree on Fire Pass, start delving into the hints, and then start delving into the records and just see how far you can get. Set yourself, set yourself an hour, okay? See what you can find in an hour and brush up on those research skills, particularly if you're stuck on a brick wall in your own family tree. Do, I, always, I always like to do this myself. If I'm stuck in my own family tree, I go and research something else <laughs> because then you're keeping those skills sharp and you're, you're looking at record collections that you might not have looked at yet. Now, I did find a uh, Canadian border crossing record for an Irene Dora flower, uh, age 21, but I wasn't sure if it was her. But then interestingly, I did find this. So this is for a Florence flower born in 1880. If I'm right, she was a nurse. Uh, this is in 1923. But what I found really interesting with this is it seems she was traveling with George Gerard. And we also get their last address. There we go. Uh, Linda, uh, good excuse for being late. Dentist, I hate going to the dentist. I hope it was not horrible, Linda. Uh, welcome. Uh, moving swiftly on before I start to feel very uncomfortable. Um, OK, so newspapers. We have added over 112,000 new newspaper pages this week. Two new titles make up this week's new releases. So we've got the Wiltshire County Telegraph, excuse me, the Wiltshire County Mirror and the Wiltshire Telegraph. Um, so the Wiltshire County Mirror was first published in 1833. It was relaunched in 1852. And then for the years we've got for that, we've got 1852 to 74, 76 to 77, uh, 1889 and then 1893. And then for the Wiltshire Telegraph, we've got 1879, 1889 and then 1901 to 1916. So a, de a, de a decent spread of years there. And then we've also got updates to another 14 titles and including one of my local ones, which is the Abigail and Penn Sarn visitor, that should say, not advertiser. That's my bad. Um, lots and lots of new years and pages for the New Market Journal and also for the Stratford upon Avon Herald. And if you head over to the Farmer Pass blog into the What's New section, you'll see a full breakdown of everything that's new this week. OK, um, so, yeah, I thought I would show you um, just why newspapers, particularly local newspapers, and lo newspapers local to where you grew up or where your family were, were from, why these can be so personal to you. Um, so I always like looking at the Abigail and Pensan visitor because I get things like this. So uh, this is an advert, the bottom right hand corner. It's an advert for my grandfather's glazing business. Um, and my uncle still runs it. 
And um, yeah, I can't remember exactly what year this is from. I think it's from sometime in the 80s. Um, but I thought that was, um, I, 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 there were loads of these in, uh, in that newspaper. If you just search for Gordon over three, you'd see loads of them. Um, I think they still use the same telephone number as well, which is quite scary. Uh, I, I spent a lot of my time in that particular, in this particular office when I was growing up, um, just because we used to go up and visit my grandfather. My grandma used to uh, sort of be a, a secretary, um, answer the phones and things. And then, as I said, my uncle, um, he now runs the business. Um, yeah. Um, and then you've also got pictures as well. So the picture on the left, my grandfather's brother, John, um, he was a local councillor. So there are loads of pictures of him in these newspapers. And I always find it quite striking how much he looks like my grandfather. Obviously, they're brothers. Um, but because there are no pictures of my grandfather in the, in the newspapers, but they are his brother, you get lots of them. And you can see, I put an arrow there, but you can see the uh, sort of the councillor chain thing with Bob um, that is there. So, yeah, loads of pictures of him. I just picked one. Um, and then the other photograph of two women, this is of my grandfather's nieces. I think Jane and Denise, I think their names are. And um, that side of the family, I don't think they still run it. Maybe they do. Uh, a sort of a garden nursery in Kimmel Bay in North Wales. Um, I think it's called something like Silver Birch or something like that. Um, but that's just them working at the nursery. I think that was from 1999, I think, that picture. So, yeah, these are very personal to me. But the beauty of it is you can delve into the newspapers. You can throw in a couple of titles that are local to your area throw in some names and just see what comes back you'll be surprised at what you can find um yeah go on a delve okay shall we do question of the week which of your discoveries do you think would make an epic who do you think you are episode this is what i want to hear about this week i'm just going to move the slides for now and i'm going to have a scroll all the way back up I'm going to see what I can find. It'll be after Matthew asked me, what's the question of the week? <laughs> OK, um, Lynn said, I think my search for John Brown, Scott and coal miner would make a great Who Do You Think You Are episode. What do you think, Lynn, about that story? What like, Have you pictured in your head how, how it would appear on screen, for example, where you would go and visit? Um, yeah, that's I want, tell, tell me what, tell me what. Uh, Kim says every single one of them you should all know my ancestors by now yeah you've got some great stories in your tree Kim uh, Karen says my first cousin four times removed father-in-law let Napoleon go and let the other men in her life uh, and the other men in her life and their dreadful, uh, dreadful behavior this would make a great story like I would love to see this on screen um, yes that's very very exciting um, Janet says the Princess Alice disaster on the River Thames in 1878. My great grand sister was one of the 500 plus victims. That would make a great story. It's utterly tragic, uh, but it's so, that event is so entrenched in our history um, because because it was so awful. Um, that, that would make a great uh, part of an episode. Uh, Anya says, since who do you are usually ends up with a theme. My direct ancestors involved in the in workers' rights and politics. One in Lancashire, who was the first Labour councillor in Wigan. One in South Wales, who was the president of the Cardiff, Penarth and Barry Cole Timmers Union. And a group of miners who were involved in the illegal combination, uh, in illegal co combination in the early 19th century in East Lothian. Yeah, I think that'd be great. And you're absolutely right. They, they do like their themes, don't they? Um, I've heard that when when they go and do the research for the show, they take a load of celebrities who are interested, but they don't end up using all the celebrities because, was it Christopher Eccleston who once said that he wasn't chosen for Who Do You Think You Are because his family tree was too boring or something like that? And he thought that was ridiculous. Like, everybody's family tree is interesting. But I thought that was fascinating. Um, but yeah, the researchers do an incredible job. Uh, there's so much ground they have to cover and yeah I get that they have to curate things and not everything makes it to the show uh, which we'll come on to afterwards on Christmas week. Um, uh, Gordon uh, says my grandfather no father on birth certificates had born in Kemp but took the name Lane who is uh, whose mother lived with the with or married uh, joined the army in 1900 was meant to have a brother Charles who's in the army as well 
couldn't find any details on Charles. Um, grandfather then rejoined for World War I, was shipped back from France some fit for service. Question is, am I Elaine or really a Kemp? Yeah, I think we've all got these in our family tree, haven't we? Or at least most of us have. So if you go back to the 1700s in my family tree, um, you this is just one instance of illegitimacy, by the way. Um, so you've got one of my ancestors who I think was Charles Overthrow and his mother was Mary Overthrow and she had four children all out of wedlock. And on all of the baptism records, um, they say baseborn child. So am I... Was I really born an overthrow or should I have been something else? Because uh, this guy, this this Charles Overthrow is my direct ancestor. Um, something like my sixth or seventh great grandfather, I think. Um, but yeah, maybe I should have had a different name too. Uh, okay, what else have we got? Uh, Andrew says, uh, my great, great, great uncle who went to sea and married a girl born on Sable Island. Fascinating place. I don't know where that is. I'm going to have to go and look it up. Um, Ellen says, my seemingly perpetual brick wall, the Kirby family, would love it if somebody cracked it for me and find out if they originated, where they originated from and if they were as hard luck as the Kirby family. I do not know about. Yeah, I think oh, it'd, be so, it'd be so great, wouldn't it, for us to just sort of give what we've done so far to uh, who do you think you are, researcher, and be like, have at it, see what else you can find. Oh, it'd be so good. I would absolutely love it. Why I should become a celebrity because then I pick on who you think you are. That'd be so good. Um, ba, 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 ba. Uh, Jane says, My three times great grandfather and his siblings, he drowned when he fell between his boat and the quay. Two of his brothers were held over, uh, held over for swindling, not sure what happened to them. Youngest brother committed bigamy, transported to New South Wales for a period of seven years. Goodness me, there's a lot going on in your family tree, Jane. I want to hear more. Uh, some discussion about the dentist. Uh, apparently, everybody is at the dentist today. Apparently, it's just the day for dentistry. Um, oh, going back to what I said about spending an hour doing like a little case study on some something in the Scotland Poor Records. I completely agree. Like, would any of us ever be able to just do it for an hour? Because I don't think I would either. I think that was um, uh, wishful thinking on my part, should we say? Um, Yes. Uh, Georgia says, my great uncle, George Bly, who was taken in by Bernardo's age 10, he was supposedly out of control. He was sent to a farm in Brantford, Ontario by Bernardo's age 11 and worked as a farmer until he was about 22. Returned to England in 1915, joined the Essex Regiment alongside his brother and George was killed in Palestine in November 1917. What, what a journey and so, so sad. Um I think I've heard this story before, Georgia, and every time I hear it, I get I get goosebumps on my arms because it's just, yeah, it's just so sad. Sue says they would have to break some brick walls. Exactly. Uh, Warner stuck on my two times great grandfather, Shackleford. My grandmother could have been in the IRA. Really? Um, uh, her mother, have her mother, but nothing more than uh, than workhouse records or another brick wall. And then my two times great grandfather, who is a minister in Wick. Yes, I often find that with ministers, vicars, reverends, and um, they their stories are quite well documented. Uh, so if you do have any of those in your family tree, you're in luck. Basically, I once found a photograph of I want to say my three or four times great grandfather on my Hickman Hitchman Hitchman side of the family on my mum's side, and. I found the photograph and I thought he looked like a minister uh, just because of what he was wearing. But I don't think he actually was. I think it might have just been a fashion thing. Oh, so many more for me to go through. Um, OK. Joe says, my nine times great grandfather, Charles Darwin, who was a solicitor um, of Rotherham and appeared at the West Riding Court Sessions in 1681 to appeal for the West Riding to pay for the upkeep of Rotherham Bridge. He was a successful winner. His wife, Anne Wilson, was descended from Richard, Duke of York, and Cecily Neville. Uh, their son, Robert, my eight times great grandfather, made bad investments and died in the pauper's prison in London. Okay, that's not so exciting. Well, it's exciting, but it's, it's sad. Um, but I love, I, I, I'm a, I, I love the Wolves of the Roses. Um, if I ever did a PhD, I want to do it on the daughters of um, 
Richard and Cecily because one one of them in particular absolutely fascinates me and not a lot's been researched on her um so if I ever did a PhD that is what I want to do on um Rita says, my two great uncles were arrested as teenagers in separate incidents, but the incidents both went to jail. I said, I tucked, you know, it might have been something very, very minor. And, you know, the law back then was just very, very strict. Uh, Matty says, I have one line way back on my father's side, which I believe goes back to Henry the First. That's impressive. On my mother's side, one of my distant cousins worked with Isabel Kingdom Brunel. That's cool. I love that. Uh, the Cashmore gun-making family, part of the family that went to Canada, uh, a ten-room lodge in 1890 with a tennis court, swimming pool uh, that used to bring all of his friends home drunk. Oh, dear. His wife left him. He finally disappeared. People looking for him regarding the mortgage. He and his wife are buried in Masonic graves in Canada. Uh, I believe they both made a journey to the Batik in 1923. That's cool. I like that very much. That's a little bit of scandal there, a little bit of bad behaviour. Yeah, I like that. Uh, they should do a behind the scenes show. Yes, absolutely. That would be so cool. Um, Matthew, they couldn't find anything with Christopher Eccleston. Oh, this, I, I, the, when, when I read it, it was him complaining that they found stuff, but they said it just wasn't wasn't very interesting. So maybe, I don't know. I, uh, Michael Parkinson said he was too boring, so he says, <laughs> I'm getting all the gossip here. Um, <laughs> I didn't know any of these. Um, I don't know if you caught, um, so Eamon Holmes is a presenter on is it GB News now, I think. And if you remember Miko, who now works for MyHeritage, he went and did a DNA reveal for Eamon. Um, that was quite interesting. I think it's on YouTube if anybody wants to go and watch it. I, I giggled a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Um, OK, so have we got any more here? Jackie says, the circumstances of my widowed great aunt having a lodger in 1939, who's the married son of the local socially high-ranking family from the local big house while his wife was living in Kensington. <gasps> oh, I want to hear more about that. Was there a little, 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 bit, little bit of scandal involved, maybe? I don't know. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it. Yes, Gordon, this is a very good question. And all I'm going to say to that is watch this space. Just what, just... I was I was hopefully going to be able to talk about something like this today, but I was asked it. I was told it wasn't ready yet, um, but hopefully by next week. So just keep keep your eyes peeled and your peeled and your ears. I, I don't know what the phrase is for that. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Rosie says, uh, "My Remshek is that right? Remshek loyalist, great, great, great." grandfather fought on the british side of the u.s border of independence and settled in canada hit by lighting but the baby he was holding survived that's very specific was that in a like a newspaper report or something like that amazing that the baby survived but it's very sad for him um heather says having to go taking my fur baby to the vet so it's a day not only for dentistry but it's also a day for vets uh, so if anybody else needs to go and take their um pet to the vet or go to a dentist appointment on you go. Uh, I'll catch you next week. And for the rest of you staying here, we're going to carry on. Um, uh, I've got so many more here. Uh, I want to write a book about some of my female ancestors. My link is through Richard. Oh, my goodness. This this is the daughter I was talking about, Jo. Jo, can you, if you get chance this weekend, please, can you private message into Farmer Past's Facebook page? And I will pick this up on Monday because this is this the eldest daughter Anne is the one who interests me most. Um, please, if if you are if you are willing, I would love to be able to talk to you about this because uh, I think she's fascinating. Um, eyes peeled, ears pinned back. That's exactly the phrase I was looking for, Karen. This is what I mean. You guys just keep me on the straight and narrow here. Um, there are so many more here, but I'm I'm gonna have to move on because I've got so much more to get through. Um, but thank you so much. Please keep them coming in because then you guys can discuss them um, between you. Um, so I wanted to talk on the theme of who do you think you are. Um, I wanted to do a, a very brief, not a review of this season, 
because the last episode I think was last night and that was Leslie Manville's episode um this isn't too spoilery so if you're not caught up um don't worry like what I'm going to do here is just show you that the what some of the records on fire my past okay they can't tell the whole story but they can absolutely tell some of the story and then you can go to you know other family history websites and then you you'd need to go to like libraries and archives etc and um, museums but you can tell some of the story on fire my past and i know i'm preaching to the converted here but if you're speaking to anybody and they maybe haven't started their family tree yet and they watch who do you think you're on they think oh my goodness why can't i do that you can do some of it, absolutely. So I'm just going to, I'm going to take some of the episodes and I'm going to focus on some of the stories that were pulled out. So just one ancestor per per, uh, per celebrity and just show you that this information is on from my past and it might be in records that you maybe didn't realise we had, for example. It might be a little bit more obscure. Um. So yeah, I am preaching to the converted here, but I thought you'd you'd enjoy this anyway. Um, so let's start with Claire Foy. Uh, I absolutely love Claire Foy. She's a great actor, appeared in The Crown and so many other things. I think she's great. Um, her episode was, oh, I was watching it back yesterday um, about this particular event. So her two times great grandfather, Henry Stimson, died from drowning. And the backstory of this was that he was in the border regiments that stationed at Carlisle Castle. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of the activities that he was involved in at the time was something called the paper chase. Um, it was a grueling cross-country race, um, very popular in the army. And you had two teams, so you had the hares and the hounds. Um, and this was in October, okay? And at one point they had to cross the river. And apparently... They should have had a boat, but the boat wasn't ready. So they went into the river and the river was apparently flooding at the time. So it was very, very high. The, 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 the current was quite was quite bad. And um, three of the men uh, were carried away and drowned. And there is a full, long report, very, very detailed in the Carlisle Patriot that we have on Farmer Past. And what you can see on screen here is actually just a very, very short snippet of it. The event is described in very, very rich, tragic detail. Now, Henry left a wife and five children. And I'm getting goosebumps now, but there was part of the episode where Claire went to visit the part of the river where his body was found. It was actually uh, quite away from when they entered the river. So the current had had swept them um, further down the river and you know detail such as the fact that he had uh, a scratch on him when his when his body was found um, and yeah it's very very emotional um, and that what I quite love about who do you think you are as well is that essence of walking in your ancestors footsteps and um, some of the stories are uh, obviously very emotional, like this one, but then you have slightly happier ones too, and shocking and funny. And But I think that's quite special. Um, I thought for a while I would quite like to go to... There's a, a village in North Wales where I know my, some of my ancestors were from on my dad's side. And I'd just really love to visit that church. I've never been, even though it's, it's less than... 40 minutes away from my hometown I think uh, I would, would just really like to go um let's move on so then we've got Bear Grylls this one was really cool um so he knew already that his great-grandfather Lionel Ford was the headmaster of Harrow and was also a vicar uh but we actually have a photograph of him we have a record collection on Bama Pass called Harrow um photographs of pupils and masters um, so and we have this photograph. It took me two seconds to find this. And although they they showed in the show other photographs of him, including one that must have been taken on this exact day, but it's a uh, in a different it's a different pose. They didn't show this one, and we have it. It's quite cool. And then we've also got them in the 1921 census as well, with two of his daughters, Lavinia and Margaret. And then. 
we've got some great photographs. So this, um, these photographs and this newspaper page, this was actually shown in the show. And they obviously have to come to uh, to us um, to, to get permission to use these. And there was these fantastic photos of this, this, this wonderful headmaster who's apparently such a family man. And there were so many um, like testimonials of his character. And you just look at these photographs and you think, oh, gosh, he was just lovely. Um, he's also in our uh, Teachers Registration Council records. And he also appears in our Britain School and University Students records. And I don't think... Uh, the show touched on either of these, but again, they have to, they have, so, sometimes they have so much, they have to curate what they show. Um, but we learn here, for example, that, um, you know, all the prizes he won, his qualifications, um, that he had a brother, um, and then you get more pictures of the news from the newspapers as well. There's so many of him, it was wonderful. Um, you get one of him and um, Bear's grandfather, Neville, you get one of uh, Neville with his mother, Mary, and then you also get this, this very uh, regal portrait of uh, Lionel from 1925. I love these. I love photographs. The amount of times I say this, that photographs of our, our close ancestors are just so, so special, especially when you never met them. Like, you can look at a photograph and you get can get some some measure of who they were as a person and their character. Um, very briefly on Kevin Clifton. Um, so he had an ancestor called John George McTavish. Um, now he actually appears in this record set, which I didn't even know we had, uh, called the Lower Canada Census of 1842. And he was a trader and he's listed here as such. I think I'm actually pointing to the wrong, pointing to high and synth there. If you look up, you can see John George McTavish. Um, it's a it's a very early census uh, and for Canada and it's got original images. Winner! If you have Canadian ancestors, um, this might be worth going to check out. By the way, and then finally, I think I'm doing okay for time. Um, we have Leslie Manville. Now this was last night's episode, so my apologies if you've not caught up with this yet. But again, I'm only touching on a, a very small portion of the episode. Um, so what I found really fascinating here was they discussed her three times great grandfather, Aaron Harding. So he lived in Hampshire and he was sort of a, a farm labourer. Now, he, his wife, Sarah, died aged 44. And then Aaron had nine children to look after. And Aaron was involved in the 1830 swing riots. And what ha what seemed to happen was that Aaron and many others um, were protesting their wages. They wanted higher wages for agricultural workers. And at one point, this mob apparently attacked, uh, I say attacked, they started trying to demolish the local workhouse. And the local vicar, William Cobbold, he got very obsessed about this. And if you look in our crime records, we have a lot of this story, including this original letter which I don't think featured in the episode. I think they had a transcription or a different version of it, but this is the original letter. And it describes, uh, Reverend Cobbold is describing the incident, um, and he describes Aaron and the others as the most desperate and daring of characters in my whole parish. Should they be let loose on society again, there is no saying what may happen. And he pushed for them to be transported for life. Um, this letter was actually addressed to Lord Melbourne. He was Home Secretary at the time, who was later Prime Minister. And in fact, it was Lord Melbourne who refused to use military force in the aftermath of the swing riots. But he did set up a special commission to have all of these rioters tried. Um, Aaron was actually originally sentenced to death, um, among many others. Some were um, were actually executed, I believe. Um, but Aaron and many of the others were transported instead um, over to Australia. And we also have many, many newspaper reports, actually. Aaron's name appears an awful lot. Um, so in you've got late 1830, but then also early, early 1831 as well, they appear um, because of the, the special commission in Winchester. Um, very, very long and detailed articles here. 
Um, originally, as I said, a sentence of death was passed, um, but then they were uh, sort of the left hand, the right hand side here. You can see this long list of men that were due to be executed, but I believe most of them were actually transported. But then we, we've got more. We've got more on Aaron. It's amazing. Um, we actually have um, details from when he was transported to Australia. This is a really, really detailed record here, and I absolutely love the handwriting in it. Um, so it gives, I think he's about halfway down the page, number, I think it says 60. That must be his, either his, yeah, that's his number. He's actually 41 years old. Um so it tells me that Aaron Harding uh, it gives me a description of his complexion uh, as dark or ruddy. And apparently he had black, grey, curly hair. And it tells me the name of the ship he was transported on uh, called the Eleanor, which I thought was very apt, given that I am an Eleanor myself. Uh, Ellie is actually a nickname. And she departed Portsmouth on the 19th of February 1831 and arrived in Sydney on the 25th of June. And I think they also made a stop and picked up some other uh, convicts. Um, so, yeah, I just thought that was utterly fascinating. And this is only one of the records. I actually found many more, but this was the one with the prettiest handwriting, so I included this. But, yeah, I just just a little example of... Obviously, the researchers on Who Do You Think You Are use a variety of different sources, but you can, with a bit of skill and a little sprinkling of luck, you can find so much in online records. Um, yeah. It's 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 quite cool. And I only I only used a handful of the celebrities from this season and also from those only a handful of their stories. Now, we are fast running out of time. Do we want to do I will leave this to you guys. Do we want to do a very quick brick wall session where we will look at a brick wall together um, for 13 minutes? Or would you prefer to start your weekend at 13 minutes early? <laughs> I leave it up to you. Pop it in the comments. I have a brick wall prepared, um, but I will leave it up to you. And there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm going to have to wait to see what you guys say. So Matthew's saying brick wall. Um, I'm going to see whatever, what the general consensus is, and I will just go with the general consensus. I can see lots of re recommendations for brick wall um, coming through already. Um, so I guess we're doing the brick wall. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, so um, this is the brick wall. So the way I did this last time is um, I told you what the brick wall was. Definitely the brick wall. OK, OK, OK. Are we doing the brick wall? Um, so the way we did this last time, I told you what the brick wall was. And as I was showing you a little bit of what I found, you guys would then open up a new tab on your computer or use a different device and go and see what you find and just drop it into the comments, whether you put links, um, whether you use Pharma Pass, Ancestry, My Heritage, Family Search, etc. Do whatever you want. Um, and just and just see what you can find, really. So I picked this brick wall up off one of our adverts um, in the interest of fairness, because I didn't actually ask you guys to submit these beforehand. Um, so I thought I'll just pick a, a slightly random one. So we've got here um, from Carl. My brick wall is my eternal great grandfather, George Peckham, born 1886 and married in Alice Faz Ackerley. I'd never heard this surname before. Uh, she was born in 1890 and they married in February 1915. They had a child called Wilfred in April 1915. The marriage certificate has no details of George's father or occupation. And it states that he was in, George, the King's Liverpool Regiment. However, their son's birth certificate then gives Wilf uh, the surname Packham rather than Peckham. And George's occupation as a naval stoker. So within a two, three month period, you've got somebody who goes from being in the King's Liverpool Regiment to being a naval stoker. Uh, in 1819, Alice remarries and I can't find any divorce record, no army pension and no evidence that George was killed in the First World War. Rough research shows that George possibly was from Southampton, but before 1914 and after 1918, he vanishes. I would love to know at least something of where he went or where he came from. So, and yes, you are making me work today, but I'm making you work to making you guys work as well. But you have re recommended that you want to work. So we have 11 minutes to see how much we can find about this brick wall. And while you guys are searching away, I'm going to tell you a little bit of what I found. Obviously, it's not a lot, um, but just a little bit. So. First of all, we have the um, marriage record for George and Alice. As we can see, her surname is uh, Faz Ackley. It's a great surname. Honestly, I've never heard it before today. 
and I thought that was wonderful. Uh, Marriage Call to One, 1915 in Ormskirk. So I sometimes find that being able to pinpoint locations like this is important, particularly because Carl said that he thinks George might have been from Southampton. Um, but if he was in the Navy or in the Army, it's entirely possible he was moving around, um, which is why they married in Ormskirk. I don't know. It's all speculation at this point. So take as much from this as we can. And then the next thing I went to have a look at is I found on the 1921 census, I searched for Wilfred, the son, and I found him in, I think he was in Ormskirk as well at the time. Um, Nine Chapel Lane, I think this is in Ormskirk. Um, so he's in the household of his grandparents, John and Jane um, Fazakali. Uh, Gina says she uh, thinks it might be Polish. Interesting. Um, no, I'm going to get distracted by, the fact, by that fact now. Uh, but it's useful to know. So he's in the house of his grandparents. His mother, Alice, is then as well. And her surname is now Crab. And it says that she was born in Formby uh, in Lancashire, just like Wilfred was. Uh, he, she was says, it says here she was born around 1893. Now, the crucial bit of information for me here is that Wilfred is listed under marriage or orphanhood as parents both alive. And yet Alice has remarried. Apparently, I haven't yet found a marriage certificate for that. Um, so if anybody can find a marriage record for Alice to Crab, I would love to see it because I didn't manage to find that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Carl was saying that he's found a divorce record. Um but divorces from around this time, I don't believe, are online. So unless he's gone to, I think, the probate registry, he wouldn't have found it. Um, so I thought that was particularly interesting. Um, Linda's been finding some interesting things. Let me go ahead with this. Uh, so Linda says, uh, George Peckham, born around 1886, departed Liverpool, England, and arrived 28th of January 1980 in New York. So maybe he... Maybe he left. That's quite interesting. OK, mind boggling a little bit there. Good work. Well done, Linda. Uh, Karen says divorce might be National Archives. Yes, that is a very good point, Karen. Thank you very much. Um, at least an index. Um, you might not get the full divorce records, um, but yes, you might at least get the index. Um, so that might be worth checking out. I absolutely agree with you on this, Kim. Um, I have found examples of where mistakes were made in this field, in this column on the census. Um, it could be wrong. I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think I would be wanting to prove that it was wrong. So if I can absolutely find a death for George pre-19th of June 1921, then it would prove that this was uh, incorrect. Because... It, this has been filled out by his grandfather, John. It might have been just a slip of the hand. You know, he might have just gone, oh, his parents are both alive. I've, I have seen instances of people making mistakes. Um, and I went, the other, the, the last thing I wanted to show you was um, Carl mentioned the possible link to Southampton. I did find this. So this is in Southampton, uh, the household of Elizabeth Sutton. And in it, you've got her nephew, George Peckham, born in Southampton. And he was working as a fitter um, at the time. But it, he is listed as single. But again, that could be a mistake slash lie. Um, we don't know what's happened here. Um, George could have abandoned um, his wife and child, given as well that we can absolutely clearly see that Wilford was conceived out of wedlock because uh, George and Alice married in February 1915 and then Wilford was born in the April. Um, that's a possibility as well that he abandoned them. Um, equally, they just got divorced or they just parted amicably and uh, she ended up marrying somebody else bigamously. I don't know. Um, I do keep coming back to the record you found, Linda, of the passenger list. What I would be wanting to do, 
and I didn't quite have enough time to do this, was see if I could find George in the 1911 census um, or find a military record for him or a Navy record for him for around the year 1915. Um, that's what I would be wanting to see. Uh, you guys are doing really well here. Thank you, Anya. The marriage to William Crabbe was in 1918. Perfect. That's what that fits with what Carl said. Um, but good to know that you've seen it. I often like if people if people tell me things about their brick walls and the facts that they found, I do like to go and just see them for myself because um, there might be something that I could take from the record that they haven't, but also vice versa. Um, it's always good to get your facts straight, though, I think. Uh, Linda says there was an 1886 birth registration in Southampton for George. Excellent. Um, I would want to see, though, and I appreciate this might not even exist. Um, I would want to see some other documentation or evidence that gave George's birthplace of Southampton. So rather than rather than us looking i mean we're, we're maybe taking carl's word for it here but he does say it's a, it's a theory um rather than just searching for george peckham's or peckham's born in 1886 um and just picking one that looks right i would want to see a navy document or a military document that, that gives his place of birth that hopefully also mentions his wife alice and his child wilfred that is the kind of thing i'd want to be looking for and i did go into the military records just to see if I could find anything that matched. And I ran out of time, unfortunately. Uh, Matthew says there's a George Packham in Liverpool North uh, who died in 1946. Birth year is 1880. Um, but I mean, possibly, Linda. Um, I'm assuming positive intent here. Um, but I think all of us are thinking, OK, where's the evidence for that? Are we just guessing that he was born in Southampton or do we have something that specifies it? Now, Karen says there is a 1939 entry with the George and Alice Packham in Essex. Interesting. Do we have on that any dates of birth, um, an occupation for George that might help or anybody else that's in the household for example i did i think i did have a look for wilfred in 1939 uh i couldn't see him if somebody else can find me find for me um joe says i don't know southampton's right records i'm finding for southampton are george william peckham and he's still alive in the 1939 register this is so interesting because that this is so important when you're looking for something like this it's always good to have a look at the other people it could be because you can then rule them out and you can also rule these theories such as he was born in Southampton. You can also rule that out as well. Um, I mentioned two weeks ago that I came onto Friday's Live on the back of a lecture from Jen. We had like a little internal lecture on my advanced and uh, intermediate and advanced uh, genealogy research. Absolutely fascinating. But we have the second round of that today, just before I came onto this. And uh, Jen gave us um, two pieces of information, two bits of evidence about the same event. Um, and she got us to do uh, look at the first one and draw everything we could from that um, and say, like, suggest where we would go on the back of that. And then look at the second piece. It was so fascinating. My brain was just buzzing um, with possibilities but she's really got me thinking about okay what can we take from this bit of evidence uh can we trust it uh where else can we corroborate um things like the birthplace of southampton absolutely fascinating i'm going to try and get jen to do these uh for you guys at some point i think because i think you'd really like them um linda's saying there's a matching death registration in southampton and Karen says, uh, 30th of June, 1887, scrap iron worker for the 1939 register. Right. Well, that brings us nicely to five o'clock UK time. I hope you enjoyed that little whistle stop tour of some of the Who Do You Think You Are episodes and a little bit of a brain teaser as well uh, for all of us, I think, um, really getting our research skills going. 
a little bit towards the end of the week there. Um, if you like doing sort of snappy brick wall busting like this, we can we can certainly do more. Um, what I might do though, because I'd like to do your brick walls. Um, so if if I do this again next month, what I might do is ask for your brick walls in advance. Or you can just leave them on this thread, on this video, and I'll pick them up. Um, just as a reminder before we go, uh, if you do want to come to uh, our Heritage Open Day event in Quarry Bank on the 16th or the 17th of September, if you want to come to the ticketed event, you need to apply um, to see if you can get a ticket. But if not, you can come to the open event on the 17th, which is the Sunday. If you are able to be there, I would absolutely love to see you. It was so special to me at the Savoy last year to see some of you there. Um, so if any of you are able to make it, that would be really, 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 really lovely. Really lovely. Um, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. And I will uh, see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.